Greetings. Uh, my name is Professor Michelangelo Sabatino. I am a professor of history of architecture at the Gerald D. Hines College of Architecture here at the University of Houston. Uh, today I'm going to speak to you about modern architecture and the vernacular, which may seem quite an esoteric theme, but in fact uh, the 20th century, uh, what we refer to uh, as the modern period, more or less, uh, is uh, very much uh, a result of this engagement dialogue among uh, modern artists and architects with vernacular. Now, what exactly is the vernacular? Before we uh, begin to see images and examples of uh, buildings and paintings, uh, I think it's best to uh, identify what the subject of our uh, um, talk is. And vernacular comes from the Latin word uh, verna, uh, which means you're born in the master's house or you're native. Um, essentially that uh, brings us to this idea that there are uh, tiers to architectural history and tiers to the way we uh, uh, classify buildings. Uh, uh, vernacular is typically associated with buildings that are not specifically designed by architects, uh, but rather are designed by uh, builders uh, that don't have any specific training in architecture schools. Now, you might ask, why is that important? Well, uh, architecture training is fairly new. It, it started at the turn of the 20th century, and basically architects before didn't go to uh, architecture school. They just trained and eventually, through apprenticeship, uh, became knowledgeable about what uh, to build. So. Uh, the examples that I'm going to show you is an uh, interesting moment of overlap between what we might call uh, buildings of a pre-industrial age, that is, uh, buildings that were realized by uh, folks using very basic tools, you know, uh, saws and, and uh, element, uh, tools to uh, cut rock. Or, uh, and then we're going to see a number of architects that were inspired by these builders to then offer their own kind of contemporary um, response to that. Uh, I'm showing you this wonderful image uh, of a painting by René Magritte. It's called The Anger of the Gods, and it was uh, completed in 1960. And the reason why I'm showing you this image is to give you a broader framework in which to position this discussion on modern architecture and the vernacular, and uh, more specifically about the kind of tensions that emerge between a kind of pre-industrial world that in which many of these buildings were uh, realized uh, and a kind of industrial world that is, uh, surfaces uh, at the uh, end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century. So on the one hand you see this car, uh, sort of the ultimate expression of modernity uh, moving forward at the same time this horse and jockey which is offering uh, a simultaneously uh, an alternative pre-industrial view. Part of uh, the underlying discussion of today's talk is sort of the, the idea of transformation. That is, modern architects that were trained in architecture schools were intrigued by uh, the buildings that, uh, you know, non-educated, uh, uh, non-degreed uh, uh, builders uh, were uh, realizing. So when these architects got a hold of these buildings or looked at them either through visiting directly or perhaps even through uh, images, they saw the potential to transform these. Uh, uh, so it's not simply these architects going and uh, looking at these uh, buildings and then simply copying them, but rather transforming them. This is why I point to this wonderful image, uh, actually two images, uh, a traditional sort of uh, Swiss army knife, which is a kind of quintessential kind of ordinary object that has been transformed, as it were, uh, in the recent years to adapt to kind of needs of contemporary men and women. For example, here you'll notice there is a, a laser pointer and a flash drive where, of course, the model as it first emerged in 1890 had none of this. So this is kind of interesting transformative role uh, that uh, the creative process entails. And I, I'm showing you, as uh, although this is not directly related to architecture per se, but I'm trying to use it as an example in which you can understand the uh, way uh, one can transform without necessarily both reinventing or uh, simply copying. So it's rather an issue of tweaking. 
The next image is the cover uh, of my book, a uh, recent book, which uh, is entitled Pride and Modesty, Modernist Architecture and the Vernacular Tradition in Italy. Uh, I'm going to be speaking uh, specifically to uh, uh, my experience researching and writing about Italy in the 20th century, because I think it can serve as a, a case study in which to situate the uh, interest uh, that was uh, very much uh, shared by a number of countries in North America and Europe during uh, the years from about 1910 uh, all the way through to the 1970s. Who are the people then? And we talked about who is uh, or what is vernacular as an adjective or a noun that is something uh, that is uh, uh, in a way uh, part of a, a subcategory of architecture. Of course we know that this is problematic because uh, typically uh, it's uh, very problematic to uh, distinguish between so-called high architecture, the designed architecture, and low architecture, that is undesigned architecture. But uh, in the case of uh, our sort of general topic, what's important to remember is that the people, the people that are part of what Antonio Gamsci might call the subaltern class, the people that are just, you know, regular folks that aren't part of the elite, uh, were played an important role in this whole topic that I'm talking about today. This is a beautiful painting uh, by an Italian artist, uh, Giuseppe Pellizza da Volpedo. It's called uh, The Fourth Estate, and it was um, completed by Pellizza in 1901. And as you can see, this is a large group of peasants, that is, uh, is pr exactly those verna the, that we were referring to, peasants that were farmers. Uh, that were, at the turn of the century, uh, marginalized. They were not given the, the rights to uh, the democracy that others were slowly acquiring. And so it is this society, the peasant society, that produces those buildings, those anonymous buildings that we were talking about that rely heavily on a kind of uh, pre-industrial know-how and that are not designed by architects, but rather are just uh, uh, built by uh, uh, laborers. Now, part of this whole story is this rediscovery of these, uh, uh, this wonderful tradition, because uh, up until the turn of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, most uh, sort of folks didn't really uh, pay much attention to the architecture or the objects or the art of the so-called people. Uh, uh, they uh, tended to look at the big monuments, the big churches, the big palazzos, but they rarely looked at the uh, uh, sort of poor architecture, that is what we might call in the, say, maybe in the Houston context, the shotgun or the dog trot, the sort of uh, the vernacular architecture uh, that was typical uh, for most uh, uh, um, citizens uh, of the sort of lower working class. Uh, but again, the artists and the architects and the literati that I'm interested in are those that saw great value in those so-called poor buildings and actually saw richness where others saw only a derelict uh, a poverty. Um, even photographers began to see dignity and beauty in the uh, poor uh, working class. Uh, uh, again, uh, much along the line of the Fourth Estate, here are two images by Louis Hein, who is a famous, uh, very uh, engaged uh, uh, photographer who went ahead and uh, took photos of the uh, masses of immigrants that uh, came to Ellis Island. Uh, and, of course, these immigrants came primarily from a peasant society, uh, from that same subaltern class that Agamshi uh, talks about. But, as you see in these photos, uh, uh, Hein saw great beauty in these people. Uh, to the left is Ellis Island Madonna. He's reflecting almost uh, the relationship between the mother and the child, seeing almost saint-like qualities in this otherwise very poor uh, woman. To the right is another example of one of these uh, peasants uh, that is being celebrated for their intrinsic beauty by Lewis Hein. But in architecture, it was through uh, what we call ethnography, which is a, a sort of subcategory uh, of anthropology, that architects began to discover uh, buildings. And it was through ethnographic exhibitions 
uh, that buildings were reconstructed, uh, vernacular buildings from different regions, in this case of Italy, that we were re reconstructed in a, spe in a sort of a living museum of different uh, types of buildings um, so that people that perhaps didn't visit those buildings directly could go to this somewhat of a zoo or a theme park and see them all gathered in the one place. This here is an image of a farmhouse uh, uh, of Tuscany. Here are a number of, uh, to the left, another farmhouse uh, from uh, central Italy and to the right are domestic, uh, it's a building, uh, domestic architecture in Venice. All of these buildings are uh, representative of one anonymous building uh, types, that is they're not designed by architects per se, and two, uh, these buildings represent various regional uh, uh, characteristics. For example, if we were to make the, uh, compare it to the states, you'd say the difference of vernacular architecture in the East Coast, New England is a typical white uh, so-called salt box. If we were to go to New, Me New Mexico, we would see the sort of adobe being, uh, adobe construction being the so-called vernacular architecture of that region. So vernacular architecture is on the one hand uh, describes sort of the kind of class of buildings, uh, of non-architect uh, designed buildings, but also it tends to represent the kind of uh, regional indigenous buildings that are different from area to area. So, we said that uh, architects began to discover ethnography uh, uh, and understand the different traditions and the different buildings that were uh, uh, found throughout the regions of Italy. Uh, and so they began to see, thanks to events like the 1911 ethnography exhibition in Rome, they began to see uh, opportunity to appropriate these models and transform them. Again, the sort of beginning of our uh, discussion was uh, all around how do you uh, creatively take something and transform it uh, to meet your new needs and the new needs of the people who inhabit it. Uh, this is one uh, uh, example uh, moving forward chronologically and I will show you a number of images chronologically uh, that sort of continue the theme uh, uh, that uh, is uh, uh, before us today. Here we have a wonderful image of a drawing by uh, an Italian architect called Virgilio Marchi. It has, it's a drawing of vernacular architecture of the south of Italy. And you can notice how this building sort of adapts to the grade change and the rich topography of that area of Italy. And to the right, he, has, uh, he takes the drawings of this sort of building that was realized uh, in a very remote kind of pre-industrial area of the country and he uh, uses it as a source of inspiration for a new building on the cover that he draws on the cover of his uh, book called Futurist Architecture and he uses these very ancient sources to uh, as examples of a so-called futurist architecture which in theory was supposed to be uh, all about the future nothing about the past but so this very interesting kind of connection. If you look even at the way the stairs wrap around the building in the old building and the way they wrap around them in the new building, which is a hydroelectric station, which is, is you can see wires, electric wires weaving in and out of that building, you begin to see that uh, for Marquis, the future was uh, uh, indebted also to uh, the uh, vernacular past. And so this is a, an interesting paradox because everyone that was writing about futures and was saying, oh, we have to do away with uh, old Italy, and yet he's using it strategically to uh, cast a, a new vision of, of tomorrow. Uh, uh, a number of artists as well begin to look at, you know, ancient machines like, uh, like uh, wagons that were brightly painted as a source of new futurism and as we can see here in this wonderful painting by Fortunato de Pero to the right and a number of images of uh, uh, carts that were actually horse-drawn carts to the left uh, that were painted and the two meld uh, with the under the uh, idea of uh, conjoining both uh, futurist uh, uh, attitudes with vernacular pass. Um, the most, uh, uh, one of the most bold examples of vernacular art, modernist architecture 
that tried to uh, reconcile tradition uh, and uh, modernity was this house, uh, so-called Casa Malaparte. It was named after the owner of the house, wh whose name is Curzio Malaparte, and it was designed by uh, an architect, Adalberto Liber, and the uh, stonemason called Adolfo Amitrano, uh, completed on the uh, rocks, uh, buffs of Capri between 1938 and 42, Capri being in the south of Italy. And if you look at the image of this uh, wonderful building, it, uh, you begin to see how, uh, first off, it's made entirely out of stone. And yet, uh, and stone, of course, being a kind of a traditional building material, typical of vernacular buildings of that area. And yet, there's a kind of mo modern abstraction, flat roof, uh, uh, to this uh, building. So we begin to see a tension emerging between something that seems modern, sleek, almost as if it was a kind of uh, uh, a boat marooned on this buff, uh, but that is still beholden to a vernacular tradition that is what we might call pre-industrial. So there's this kind of interesting tension between two worlds that are synthesized in this one building. Here we see Malaparte to the left uh, uh, when he took some uh, trips uh, to visit uh, vernacular buildings uh, in, on islands surrounding Capri uh, and uh, we see how uh, this image that was taken to the left of uh, Malaparte at uh, uh, visiting uh, so an island called Lipari and to the right we see the Casa Malaparte view which shows the steps going up to the roof which are very much beholden to this vernacular source that Malaparte had seen uh, just months before. So we begin to see this kind of transformative quality looking at vernacular, Liba was a modernist architecture architect rather, and we begin to see how these two elements transform to create a new modernist synthesis that is representative too of a sort of fascist Italy which was uh, uh, trying to stress Italianness over and in sort of belonging to a Mediterranean context over uh, other forms of uh, national identity. There was a number of problematic uh, issues that were emerging during those years uh, which involved uh, this nationalist ideology. Fascism was uh, a right-wing uh, anti-democratic movement that uh, advocated for uh, sort of uh, emphasis on national identity that is uh, being Italian. Uh, of course other uh, examples uh, of t uh, totalitarian regimes during those years uh, are abundant. Uh, the most uh, closely aligned being with national uh, socialism in Germany and we begin to see some of the debates that were evolving during those years uh, among modern architects interested in vernacular took on very different very different uh, uh, architectural uh, implications um, on the left we see this image very polemical image uh, very racist image of a um, uh, German architect uh, arguing against uh, modern architecture in the Mediterranean vernacular in favor of pitched roofs uh, that we see to the right uh, with the Nazi uh, swastika. Uh, and yet some of the hardcore, very hardcore uh, examples of what we call hi high modernism, like Le Corbusier, were very much interested in uh, uh, looking to the vernacular as part of their ongoing uh, research into uh, modernity. Uh, here we see a nice contra, uh, juxtaposition between uh, Le Corbusier's most iconic work, his Villa Savoie of 1929 and 30, and uh, uh, the background, his uh, Villa Mandreau uh, in Le Prade, which is a little town in, on the Mediterranean, completed just one year later. If on the right, uh, the Villa Savoie is this kind of uh, abstract box floating uh, on the air, lifted up with piloti. Uh, his uh, Villa Mandro, and, uh, on the other hand, uses vernacular technologies, that is, rubble wall, flat uh, uh, roof, to uh, create a weekend retreat for Madame de Mandro. Corbusier was very interested in the vernacular object as well. Here are some of his photos of vessels. So he wanted to look at the objects that the so-called ordinary people were producing to then try to figure out a way of uh, 
coming up with uh, a way of producing them uh, within a realm of industrialization so as to uh, on the one hand keep a kind of uh, uh, association with tradition and regionalism but at the same time move into the world of industrialization. Um, another example as we move uh, uh, quickly through the examples is this uh, building uh, it is called the Hotel North South if you can see there's a number of uh, repetitions it's a little balcony with a, a, a bathroom projecting forward you see there's a, the impression one gets is that this is uh, a very modern building uh, flat roof reinforced concrete and one would think that it has nothing to do with the vernacular in fact uh, it has very much to do with the vernacular that is in the Mediterranean country and we can see from the image at the very top these vaults of very identical symmetrical buildings uh, in the Mediterranean countries the masons would build sort of repetitive buildings uh, and then the architects like the architect of this uh, hotel north south who his name is Andre Lursa L U R C A T uh, would take up uh, this uh, uh, lesson from the Mediterranean stone builders and simply replicate uh, in a sort of serial uh, way uh, these uh, same uh, units, as it were. There were uh, oppos uh, opponents to that kind of position, and here we see Herbert Reed in his famous book, Art and Industry, was saying that he uh, wanted an industrial vernacular that had nothing to do with uh, sort of traditional uh, pre-industrial vernaculars, and we see here he juxtaposes the housing estate by Walter Gropius uh, in Karlsruhe, Germany, to sort of circuit boards. But in Italy, and back to Italy where we started, uh, there's a number of architects that say we're advocating for modern uh, and vernacular architecture, one of whom was this architect called Giuseppe Pagano, whose exhibition of 1936 on rural architecture uh, advocated in favor of uh, architects looking to vernacular architecture, extant vernacular, that is, buildings that were already there uh, and uh, so-called uh, produced by so-called anonymous builders, and uh, look at those in order to inspire new contemporary architecture. This is an image of an exhibition he uh, set up in 1936 with very crisp black and white photos of the buildings that he had gone around and photographed in the Italian peninsula. This is perhaps one of the most prominent examples of that uh, generation of architects looking to incorporate cues that glean from the uh, rural vernacular. Uh, this building by uh, Ignazio Gardella was completed in 1938, and as you can see, it's a very modern-looking building. It has a flat roof, it has ribbon windows, it has uh, glass box blocks, and yet, if you pay attention to this upper story, you begin to see that uh, Gardella introduces subtly a part of Italy's vernacular agrarian past. Uh, this is called uh, a screen, a diaphragm, and it's made entirely of brick. And Gardella uh, was taking this uh, screen brick, uh, screen of bricks, directly from rural buildings, and we see a number of here uh, gathered in uh, pictures. Uh, so he was introducing this screen, and the reason being that the screen allowed for air to traverse it. And this was a, a sanatorium, a tuberculosis sanatorium. So people that had been diagnosed with tuberculosis uh, were uh, encouraged to breathe in fresh air, and above all, they didn't want to be seen uh, by everyone. There was a bit of taboo uh, if you had tuberculosis, and so this screen serves as a double function. It serves as uh, a screening privacy, but also allowing for the air to come through. Uh, and thus uh, satisfy the need to uh, have uh, continued exposure to uh, fresh air. And so this is an example of a, a modernist building right? that, need, that responds to uh, a, a very specific program, and it does so thanks also to the help of the role of uh, vernacular buildings that predates the modern world. Here we see uh, a view, uh, a picture that I personally took uh, on the other side of the screen, and uh, the building as it's aged some uh, 70 years later. This is another uh, uh, building that Gardella also designed where you see this screen, a uh, brick screen is used to 
uh, capture the symbol of the cross. Uh, so they were uh, very modest means, and these architects were, were very interested uh, in capturing the modesty of the vernacular tradition and its associations with the, uh, the agrarian class, the so-called people, in order to make simple but powerful uh, modernist architecture. In fact, the title of my book, Pride and Modesty, is an expression that Giuseppe Pagano, the, the same architect who uh, set up the 1936 exhibition, uh, used uh, to describe uh, certain forms of architecture that were both uh, creative and transformative, but at the same time resisted the urge to be uh, monumental and bombastic, uh, like many of the buildings that the then regime, fascist regime, was putting forward. Uh, his uh, building here, uh, it is a weekend house that he designed for Milan, a city of northern Italy, in 1942. He referred to this as just an ordinary thing, uh, a building that uh, did not want to be pretentious, but at the same time uh, wanted to be part of the landscape. He uses brick, uh, rather, he uses stone, field stone, he uses uh, wood. Uh, and so he uh, essentially taps into that vernacular tradition that he uh, discovered uh, photographing it across the country and uses it, transforms it, to offer his own version of the modern. In the post-war, and we're moving now uh, beyond the 1920s, the 30s, and 40s, uh, as we move closer to the end of the lecture, in the post-war, uh, there's a number of architects that are uh, rethinking the vernacular as it, as it relates to needs of the uh, former peasant uh, uh, class that has now moved, or is beginning to move, uh, from the countryside to the city to become the new working class proletariat. Uh, and that working class proletariat uh, needs places to go and uh, live. And so these are that uh, this image is a, a moving image of all the sort of the anxiety and the uh, sort of fear that many of these folks felt as they went from their small town realities, small uh, agrarian villages and hamlets to the big city, in this case a big city of Milan, this is the train station of Milan. Uh, architects anticipating this kind of anxiety of, of being uprooted uh, began to design housing estates you know, uh, that could uh, then be uh, uh, very sympathetic to the, uh, not only to the functional practical needs of these people, but also to the emotional kind of needs. That is, they were, uh, uh, these architects began to use the same colors, the sort of dark yellows and reds, typical of farm buildings, and they also began to uh, introduce uh, elements like these uh, uh, um, external walkways that were places where these people could congregate and sort of uh, reenact the kind of lives that they had had in the villages that they had left behind. In terms of objects, uh, there's a number of uh, objects that even pick up this theme of the interaction between the vernacular, or the pre-industrial vernacular, and sort of a modernist uh, attitude to uh, the present. Uh, we have a, a wonderful chair by, uh, by Gio Ponti, it's called the Super Leggera, which he takes very, you know, modest materials like ash and uh, reed and creates a very, uh, a ver what he calls a new vernacular uh, chair. There's a number of also uh, uh, architects that are responding to what uh, uh, we refer to as the leisure class, that is people that had uh, money to be able to go off to the weekend skiing or, or weekend house. And he also, uh, architects like this, for example, Franco Albini, designed this mountain resort based on a number of vernacular uh, architecture uh, that they had seen in that region, primarily this uh, <coughs> sort of uh, wood and stone building, this so-called rascard that becomes a source of inspiration for this uh, hostile retreat that Albini completes in 1952. So uh, here you see the kind of creative way that uh, Albini takes what are otherwise uh, in the um, extant model uh, very short little 
uh, uh, supports. He elongates them uh, and makes them almost uh, surreal uh, so as to accommodate the grade change. This is on the slope of a hill. Here we see the Rascard again. These are the traditional buildings, and this is the, the new kind of transformed version that Afanco Albini uh, promotes. There's uh, another uh, attempt by Carlo Molino. Uh, skiing was a big uh, sort of uh, uh, weekend uh, activity for some of the Italian leisure class. Uh, and uh, so people like Molino, uh, Carlo Molino designed this uh, mountain retreat in the late 40s to accommodate this new need. Here it, again we have this interaction between vernacular models and uh, contemporary uh, modernist architecture. As we move then forward, uh, leaving behind the 50s and uh, the uh, enter into the early 60s, we begin to see how even within sort of an international attitude, uh, the vernacular becomes a source of inspiration uh, for Italian architects. Here we see an image of Brussels uh, in the World Fair of the mid-50s and the Italian response uh, on the one hand uh, uh, to create an, a bit of a village based on vernacular models uh, in great uh, contrast to uh, this great monumental atomium that we see to the right uh, that was a symbol of the Brussels Expo of those years. Finally, uh, architects, Italian architects, claim uh, again and again, uh, well into the 60s, 70s, and 80s, this need to embrace uh, or learn from the vernacular uh, models. Here we have De Carlo in the University of Urbino, his student housing. Uh, this is a bit of a necropolis of student housing. He uses the typical relationship he gleaned from vernacular models and uh, to adapt the building to the site to create these student uh, housing uh, model uh, units that he uh, continued to add on in the course of 30, 40 years. Here is a view, the terraced element that looks to the uh, hills. Again, this is very much uh, an, some uh, transformative act that he is able to put forward thanks to his interest and study of extant vernacular models. Uh, in his Urbino, uh, uh, um, rather his uh, subsequent work uh, in Venice or outside of Venice in Mazzorbo he takes the very colorful vernacular dwellings that we see to the right he transforms them to adapt them to modern needs uh, uh, and he offers his new housing estate completed in 1985 so these these uh, extant vernacular are you know uh, 19th century vernacular and he uh, makes, uh, uh, he draws and he realizes a whole new vernacular that is both sympathetic uh, with the past but at the same time uh, reinventing that same past. And then finally, uh, we'll close with two images um, uh, of an architect called Aldo Rossi. Uh, Aldo Rossi uh, was an Italian architect who was also interested in the so called ordinary things, that is, the vernacular everyday objects. Uh, 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 that were not necessarily designed by architects, but at the same time he was a trained architect, and so he was able to bring that kind of worldview to bear on uh, his design. Uh, this is a lighthouse theater that he designed for Toronto, Canada. The lighthouse is an ordinary object. We typically don't know or uh, we don't credit any designer for lighthouses, and here he uh, uses a sort of poetic, uh, he enhances the poetic qualities of the lighthouse through his transformative gesture. And then finally, the last uh, uh, drawings here uh, to the left is one of his drawings of uh, cabanas that one finds, uh, the ordinary cabanas that one finds in the, on the beaches of Europe. Uh, Rossi is very intrigued by the kind of power of this simple object, not unlike uh, Lewis Heim was intrigued by the power of these simple yet uh, dignified uh, immigrants that uh, came to Ellis Island from Italy and elsewhere. Uh, Rossi sees dignity in these silent objects and he even goes as so far 
as uh, uh, redesigning them to be used as uh, units, storage units in the home, as we see it to the right. So you see, in some, uh, we have seen at least 10, 15 architects that, uh, and uh, essentially that discovered the vernacular, that is the objects and the architecture, the buildings that non-designers had produced and fell in love with them. And uh, they fell in love with them, they studied them, and they ultimately transformed them to uh, reflect kind of the uh, a new ethos uh, uh, that we might associate with the 20th century as an ethos that was uh, much more uh, egalitarian uh, and much more interested in the people and the sort of ordinary objects uh, than just the high, uh, what we, um, the sort of monuments of the past. Thank you very much.